Uh, good evening. Hi. We're going to start in just a couple of minutes, but in the meantime, if you would turn down your cell phones, that would be great. Thank you so much. Uh, there is a reception tonight um, in, across the green in the basement of Case College Center in the spa to which you're all invited. Right, we will begin. Great to see you all here. First, a passage in a long ago essay by Catherine Ann Porter on D.H. Lawrence. Quote, Lawrence the man, Porter writes, and Lawrence the artist are more than usually inseparable. He is everywhere and everywhere the same in his letters, his criticism, his poetry, his painting, the uneasy, suffering, vociferous man who wanted to be all in all in all things, but never discovered what the all is or if it exists." Unquote. A very great piece of writing, that Catherine Ann Porter essay back from 1960, and I find it tempting to ask whether we might say of Joyce Carol Oates anything like what is said of D.H. Lawrence. Are Oates the person and Oates the artist more than usually inseparable? If so, how would you know that? And then is it possible that Joyce Oates is everywhere the same in her poems and stories and novels and nonfiction and reviews? Is there a single overriding obsession or issue that dominates her imagination? Impossible in this case to think of the person and her work as inseparable, except in the obvious sense that every maker is somehow implicated in what she makes, and that it may be possible to find in any work what we take to be signs of the maker's characteristic preoccupations. More than usually inseparable, Porter says of Lawrence, but when we turn to the work of Joyce Carol Oates, we find, on the contrary, not only a wildly various range of settings and character types and issues, but an equally various range of accents and emotions. To say that each of these clearly reflects the singular outlook of the person named Joyce Carol Oates is to propose what is clearly not possible. For if the vulnerable and the audacious, the weak and the strong, the brilliant and the dim, the thoughtful and the thoughtless, the compassionate and the stony, all are said to be inseparable from the person who created the characters embodying those attributes, well, then what have we said but that Joyce Oates encompasses in herself everything, every possible thought and inflection, and is thus, not so far as we can tell as readers, a mere person in the sense intended by Catherine Ann Porter. Clearly, it isn't true in any usual sense that Joyce Oates is everywhere the same in her many different kinds of writing. You sink into her recent novel, Carthage, and you find yourself engaged with sentences quite different in texture and emotional timbre from the sentences you find in her recent memoir, A Widow's Story, or the novella called Probate. Of course, you can identify common themes in some of Joyce's works, 
or narrative strategies that serve somewhat similar purposes, but Joyce brings to each work different kinds of intensity so that you find in one what feels like a sort of buoyant, racing freedom, and in another, severities, bespeaking a very different sort of patient excavation. Here, in one story, you feel that just about everything is out there on the surface, where in another story, nothing really important is set out, everything that matters seething out of sight and waiting to emerge. To say of such a writer that she is everywhere the same would be to get her utterly wrong. It isn't just that Joyce Oates operates comfortably with the moods and devices we associate with the literature of mystery or romance or the Gothic or high modernist experimentation. This is obvious. The crucial thing is that Joyce inhabits each voice or mood she chooses with total confidence and authority, so that you feel as a reader that it belongs absolutely to her, that you are hearing her own true voice of feeling, when in fact she herself hears or overhears or invents hundreds of different voices and projects them with astonishing, sometimes sinister force and velocity. We've said before, all of us, that for all the variety of Joyce's work, we can yet hear her in each new work she gives us. When we say that it's that sort of thing, no doubt, we are thinking of the dark elemental force we have found in many of her best works, an urgency never quite decent or tolerable, the intimation of an overmastering, barely controllable panic or chaos, bespeaking some extremity, a feeling or grief, a reach perhaps into the forbidden or the unsayable. And that is fair enough. We do often hear that accent in Joyce's most compelling work. But then again, it is by no means the only accent we hear in work that is sometimes comic. We've heard Joyce's comedy in this auditorium many times, sometimes contemplative, often quietly searching, the voice in Joyce's writing now responsive to the song of the sirens and elsewhere to the voice of nightmare or lament or defeat or protest. Capacious beyond measure, the imagination of this writer, Joyce Carol Oates. Thank you, Bob, for such a gracious introduction. As I tweeted, I think yesterday, writers who are introduced by Bob Boyers sit there breathless, hoping to find out what it is, though in a very elevated way, what we've been doing. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so true. It's just really an honor to, it's an honor to be here and an honor to, to be introduced by, by Bob, who is a very Mozart of introducers. Well, this evening, uh, I'm going to be reading a story I've never read aloud before, and I've been sort of hastily editing it so it, it, it isn't quite as long as it ordinarily would be. And I hope that I have the voice to read it. <clears throat> I'll just have to see what happens. Um, I will pause between little sections. Basically, there are two people speaking. One is a young woman. She's about 30 years old and the other is a 71-year-old distinguished elder poet. <clears throat> so I have to try to do these voices. So I will be very happy to try to answer questions that people might have at the end of the reading. So I very much look forward to that. This is sort of a legendary audience up here at the, at the Writers Institute. The audiences are always very special. Every person, every face looks so in, intense and, and kind of intelligent, and <laughs> which is, not the same as audiences everywhere where the sort of pixelated faces that, you know, that y you really can't even bring into focus. But here everybody is very much in focus. <clears throat> the story is called Lovely, Dark, Deep, and it's from my next book, which is called Lovely, Dark, Deep. It has, 
a very nice cover showing a kind of foliage scene, a kind of sinister foliage, and a woman or young woman's very pale hands are sort of clutching at this foliage as if behind the foliage is some figure or form which we suppose is a masculine monster of some kind. It's very suggestive and it's, it's, it's subtle. <laughs> so female masochism is sometimes subtle. <clears throat> Lovely, dark, deep. Breadloaf Writers' Conference, Breadloaf, Vermont, 18th August, 1951. Here was the first surprise, the great man was much heavier and much more solid body than I'd anticipated. The sensitive young poet face of the photos, at least the photos I'd put in my bedroom wall, had coarsened and thickened. Deep lines now bracketed the eyes as if the poet had too often scowled or squinted or winked to suggest the secret wickedness of the words he was uttering. The snowy white hair so often captured in photographs like ectoplasm lifting from the poet's head was thinner than any photograph had suggested and not so snowy white, disheveled as if the poet had only just arisen days from sleep. The entire face looked large, larger than you expect a poet's face to look. And the thick jaws were covered in glittering little hairs as if the poet hadn't shaved for a day or two. The eyelids were drooping near shut. Excuse me, Mr. Frost? My voice was tentative and apologetic. For here was the great man. So suddenly, in my nervous excitement, I'd anticipated walking much farther along the path to the poet's cabin in the woods, the poet's cabin, as it was called. I had anticipated knocking at a door and waiting for the door to be open, surely not by the legendary Robert Frost himself, but by an assistant or secretary, whittled since 1938, as I had made it a point to know. The poet would not have been protected by a wary wife, at least. Instead, Mr. Frost was awaiting his interviewer outside the cabin on a small porch, slouched in a swing, seemingly dozing, slack-jawed and a scribble of saliva on his mouth. In the bunch crotch of his baggy old man trousers was an open notebook, and on the floor of the plank for porch was the poet's pencil. Mr. Frost seemed to have drifted into a trance-like sleep in the midst of writing a poem. I felt a stab of excitement at such unexpected intimacy. Gazing upon Robert Frost's asleep and no one knows. The Bread Loaf Writers' Conference, as it was called, was a very busy place at this time of year. There were hundreds of visiting writers and poets and students of all ages with a preponderance of well-to-do middle-aged women. <laughs> but this part of the grounds behind the administration offices and the white clapboard residence of the chief administrators was cordoned off as private. Like an earnest schoolgirl, I was carrying a large straw satchel weighed down with books, tape recorder, notebook, and wallet. Out of the straw satchel came now, quick into my hands, my newly purchased Kodak Hawkeye. For it seemed that Mr. Frost hadn't heard my faltering voice and hadn't opened his eyes. In my hands, I positioned the camera, peered through the viewfinder at the shadowy figure, and dared to press the shutter. Very carefully, then, I wound the film to the next picture. Like stopping to s reload a shotgun, such fo photography was, you did not simply take pictures in rapid succession. Each act of picture taking was deliberate and premeditated. How strangely vulnerable Mr. Frost looked to me like an older relative, a grandfather, whom you might glimpse lying about the house carelessly groomed and only partly dressed. It was said the poet, what poet was vain of his appearance and insisted upon exerting veto power over most photographs of himself. And so it was by chance I come upon him in this slovenly state between sleep and wakefulness as in a hypnotic trance. On his bare feet, well-worn leather house slippers. I smile to think, maybe he is dreaming of an interview. An interviewer has come to him in stealth. In all, I took seven surreptitious pictures of that afternoon. A Mr. Frost slack-jawed and dozing on a port swing. 
sold to a private collector, resold to another collector, and one day to be placed in the Robert Frost Special Collections in the Middlebury College Library, discreetly cataloged, Bread Loaf, August 1951, photographer unknown. <laughs> <clears throat> Taking Mr. Frost's picture without permission was a brazen act, I know. I've never done anything remotely like this before in my life. At least I don't recall having done anything like this. Appropri appropriating something not mine that I believed to be mine, that I believed I deserved. Yet all this while I was trembling in dread of Mr. Frost waking and discovering me. Exhilaration coursed through my body. I will steal the poet's soul. It is what I deserve. It was in the late summer of 1951 when I was 31 years old and a candidate for a master's degree in English at Middlebury College that I drove to the Breadloaf Writers Conference to interview Robert Frost for a special issue of Poetry Parnassus. Are you wondering what I look like? No observer would have been surprised to learn that Evangeline Fife was a poetess, as women poets were known at this time. But it should be noted that I was pretty, quite pretty, a young woman who always looked younger than her age, which is for women the most satisfying sort of deception. <laughs> a man might enjoy being mistaken for being more sexually aggressive than he is and richer, but for women, age is paramount. It is true, I was not a strikingly beautiful woman, which would have involved an entirely different sort of strategy in confronting the male world, one more cautious. But my sort of wan, delicate, blonde prettiness seemed preferable than beauty to many men. The striking beauty is the female a man can't control in the way he might imagine he could control the delicately blonde, merely pretty woman who at 31 can still pass for a girl of 18. Also, I was petite. Men imagine that they can more readily intimidate a petite female. <laughs> Though at 31 and unmarried, Evangeline Fife wasn't exactly young any longer, I looked at Mr. Frost at 71, 77 would see me differently. Excuse me, Mr. Frost, I, I am Evangeline Fife. I, I have an appointment with you at 1 o'clock. The elderly poet's eyelids fluttered and blinked open. For a started moment, Mr. Frost didn't seem to know where he was. Had he been sleeping? And what time was this? Then the poet saw me, blinking again and even rubbing at his eyes. Ah, an attractive young stranger, standing some ten feet in front of him in the grass with fine-brushed, pale blonde hair and widened, periwinkle blue, worshipful eyes like a poetry-loving schoolgirl. As a portly peacock might do, quickly the po poet took measure of himself, glancing down his bulky body. His large hands lifted to pat down his disheveled hair, stroke his unshaven jaws, and adjust his shirt where it swelled over his belt buckle. He frowned at me and smiled as a cunning looking came into the faded, icy blue eyes, and there emerged as through parted curtains on a brightly lit stage the New England sage Robert Frost of the famed poetry readings. Yes, of course, I've been awaiting you, my dear. You are prompt, one o'clock. But I am prompt, you see, for I am already here. <laughs> Very like a schoolgirl, I stood before the poet whose gaze moved up and down my body with the finesse of a practice gem appraiser. It is always an anxious moment before a woman understands the male judgment. Yes, you will do. Mr. Frost was murmuring what a lovely surprise this was that the interviewer for poetry was me. So often the interviewer is beetle-browed and grim if a young man and thick-waisted and plain as suet if female. The poet chuckled mischievously, rubbing his hands together. There was the Yankee sage, yet more beloved the mischievous Yankee sage. A blush rose into my face, being so complimented at the expense of other less fortunate interviewers was an ambiguous gift to accept. To accept would be vain, to seem to decline would be rude. A young female soon learns the slitheringness of accommodation to her male elders by a faint frown of a smile. Yet I had no choice but to murmur an apology, except, Mr. Frost, it isn't poetry, but poetry Parnassus. Mr. Frost grunted. He wasn't sure he'd ever heard of poetry Parnassus. You will be featured on the cover, Mr. Frost, as I explained in my letter. Still, Mr. Frost frowned, a sort of thundering malevolence gathered in his brow. 
quickly I said, I mean the entire October issue will be devoted to Robert Frost. This placated the poet to a degree. He'd recovered something of his composure as placing the notebook on a table beside the swing and taping up in a playful manner a red plastic fly swatter. And what did you say your name is, dear? Oh, my name is Evangeline Fife. Mr. Frost gazed at me with mirthful eyes. Evangeline Fife, a truly inspired name. Is it authentic or shrewdly invented on the spot to prick the poet's curiosity? Oh, what a strange question. My thin-skinned fa face, already blushing, grew warmer still. My reply was a stammer. I, I, my name is authentic, Mr. Frost. As authentic as Robert Frost, eh? Oh, this was very clever. But so it seemed to me, for Robert Frost was the ideal name for the individual who'd created the poetry of Robert Frost. <laughs> I'll please have a seat, dear Miss Fife. Forgive an old man's rudeness for not rising at your approach. With a little grunt, Mr. Frost tugged me up on the porch to sit beside him on the swing. But discreetly, I took another seat in a rattan chair. I think, my dear, the cushion on that chair is damp. Belatedly, I realized that this was so, but I only just laughed airily and insisted that the chair was fine, for I did not wish to sit close behind the elderly poet on the swing. And Mr. Frost was slapping the fly swatter lightly against his knee. If it becomes too damp, my dear, please tell me. We'll find another place for your for you. <laughs> With mock primness, the poet smiled, wanting me to understand how we'd refrain from saying, for your tender little bottom. <laughs> Embarrassed, I was about to turn on my tape recorder and ask my first question when, Mr. Frost said, and who are the fifes, my dear? Oh, my heart sank in dismay. I never thought of my family and relatives as the fifes. I never gave them much thought at all. The poet's faded, icy blue gaze seemed to be pressing against my chest. I could not breathe easily. I stammered weakly. My father and my father's relatives live in Bangor, Maine. Bangor? Not a hospitable place for the cultivation of poetry, I think. He smiled at me, tapping the fly sweater lightly on his knee. And your mother's relatives, Miss Fife? She, they were ancestors, they were ancestors who lived in Salem, Massachusetts. Gleefully, Mr. Frost said, ah, there's a history, my dear. Were your mother's Salem ancestors witch hunters or witches? <laughs> oh, oh I, I don't think so, Mr. Frost. If you don't know which with certainty, it's likely the ancestors were witches. <laughs> the witch hunters were the ruling class of the Puritan settlements, and no one is ashamed of being descended from any ruling class. Mr. Frost chuckled at my look of incomprehension. Even as I ask, Mr. Frost, if we might begin the interview, he said, ignoring me, slapping the fly swatter against the palm of the hand, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. The Americans understand this admonition deep in their killer souls. All that remains for our fellow citizens is to locate the witch among us. For that, like the most vicious hunting dogs, they required guidance. Mr. Frost smiled with a strange sort of satisfaction. I have a lover's quarrel with the world, but I would not really like it if the world had any sort of quarrel with me. In the way of a bull who is both rambling and aggressive, prone to whimsical turns the observer can't predict, Mr. Frost reminisced at length on the subject of witch hunting and witches and witchery of the poet, for poetry must always be a kind of code. By this time, I'd switched the tape recorder on, begun to take shorthand in my notebook as well, for I did not want to miss a single precious syllable of Mr. Frost. I thought of his bizarre poem, The Witch of Coos, the bones of a long ago murder victim hiking up the cellar steps of a remote old farmhouse in New Hampshire, nailed behind the headboard of a, of a marital bed in an attic, like an ancient curse stirring to life. If the poet had written only this singular poem, along with one or two other poems spoken by deranged New England narrators, <laughs> the reputation of Robert Frost would be considerable as a master of Gothic. Do you believe in witches, Mr. Frost? It was a bold desperation of the timid, such an awkward query, made when Mr. Frost paused for breath and met with a disdainful frown, such as an impertinent child might receive from an elder. <laughs> 
With a sneering smile, Mr. Frost said, Poetry isn't in the business of believing, Miss Fife. Believing is a crudeness that is the prerogative of other lesser beings. These words were sort of rebuffed to my naivete, but I was eager to transcribe the startling aphorism, which was entirely new to me. If Robert Frost had uttered this previously or committed to writing, I was unaware of it. Poetry, not in the business of believing. Believing, a crudeness of prerogative of other lesser beings. Oh, very different from the homespun Frost so beloved by people like my grandmother. As Mr. Frost spoke, his faded icy blue eyes darted shrewdly about and with a sudden alacrity he wielded the fly swatter, crushing a large fly that had come to rest nearby. The black, broken body fell into the grass. If only the ignorant poetry haters among us could be dealt with us so readily, Mr. Frost <laughs> chuckled. I was about to ask Mr. Frost if he felt that there were poetry haters in the world and who these individuals might be when he daringly, and he said, I tried to counter with a question of my own, saying, and where are your people from, Mr. Frost? But this was, a, this was a blunder, for Mr. Frost did not like such contrary motions. Coldly, he said, that sort of elementary biographical information you should already know, Miss Fife. In fact, you should have memorized it. I hope you've done homework in your subject and don't expect the poor subject to provide information that is publicly available. Oh, for a moment I could not speak. I thought, he will send me away. He will laugh at me and send me away. Oh, Mr. Frost, I'm sorry. Yes, I do know. You were born in San Francisco, not in New England, as people think. And your background isn't rural. You lived in San Francisco until you were 11. Your father was a newspaper man. Irritably, Mr. Frost interrupted. That is but literally true. In fact, I have a considerable rural background. I was brought back east by my mother after my father's untimely death, and soon, uh, soon I was farming. My paternal grandfather's farm in Derry, New Hampshire. It was clear from the start that Rob Frost was a natural man of the soil, a New England by nature, if not actual birth. Shutting his eyes, leaning back to make the swing creak, Mr. Frost began to recite a poem from a, bo a boy's will in north of Boston with perfect recall. These were Mending Wall, The Wood Pile, After Apple Picking. I am overtired of the great harvest I myself desired. The poet spoke in a soft, wondering, lyric voice. There was great beauty in this voice. The New England draw with its spiteful humor had vanished. Now it was possible to discern the young Robert Frost in the flaccid and creased face, the young poet who'd resembled William Butler Yeats and Rupert Brooke in his dreamy male beauty. The poet ceased as if he'd only just realized what this final line from After, picking, after P Apple Picking meant. I asked, what does that line mean, Mr. Frost? I am overtired. A poem's meaning resides in what it says, Miss Fife. The poet cast a look in my direction that had it been a swat from the dingy fly swatter would have struck me flat in the face. As it was, I couldn't help recoiling. Mr. Frost's second book, of, second book, North of Boston, contained another of his early masterpieces, Home Burial. This poem, the poet never read to audiences. I asked him if the man and woman in the poem were himself and his wife, Eleanor, at the time of the first son's death in 1899, at the age of three, a death that might have been prevented except for the mother's Christian science beliefs. I quoted the powerful line of the woman, quote, I won't have grief so if I can change it. Mr. Frost stared at me for a long moment with something like hatred. His eyes were narrowed, his face contorted in stubbornness. There was no mistaking this man for the kindly New England bard. But he didn't answer my question. As if, we're, this, if this were an issue that had to be set right, he reverted to his previous subject. Only a poet who knew rural life intimately could have written any of my country poems. There is no poetry quite like them in American poetry, in England perhaps, the poetry of John Clare and Wordsworth, but these are very different, obviously. Oh, yes, sir, very different. You see that, do you, Miss Fife? Yes, sir, I think so.
My notebook was open to the first page of questions and carefully transcribed in my neat schoolgirl hand. But before I began, the mischievous old man peered at me again and said, You are a good girl, it seems, Evangeline. I should hope so. And what blue eyes of the hue of the New England heel all has anyone ever told you? Did Mr. Frost expect me not to know to which of his famous poems he was alluding? Shyly, I said, except if the heel all is white, Mr. Frost. Ah, you're quite correct, my dear. The oblique flirtatiousness of the virgin poetess had taken Mr. Frost somewhat by surprise. An ideal opportunity. The poet was gazing at me as if hoping to be surprised further. And so in my low, thrilled, schoolgirl voice, I recited that brilliant, chilling poem that begins, I saw a dimpled spider. If you had ears to hear, you could detect in the schoolgirl breathlessness something very far from school or girlishness. At the conclusion of my recitation, Mr. Frost laughed and took up the fly swatter. He stuck the porch in raucous applause. He couldn't have been more delighted if a small child had recited his poem without the slightest idea of its meaning. That is my most wicked sonnet, my dear. I'm frankly surprised you would have memorized it. I responded that design was a perfectly executed Petrarchan sonnet, which I had memorized as a schoolgirl years ago, before I understood it. <laughs> and you feel you understand it now, dear Evangeline? You little fool, trained in poetry by spinster stool te teachers. What do you know of me? This is her, th she's imagining he's thinking that. Oh, I was reluctant to take up the challenge. I sat with meek lowered eyes, turning over a page of my notebook while on the table an alarm clock continued a relentless tick, tick, tock, tick, 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 that would have been distracting except for the intensity of our conversation. In a more serious tone, Mr. Frost said, in great poetry there was always something signatory, a word, a phrase, a break in rhythm, a stanza break, that is un unexpected. No ordinary versifier could come up with it. In Emily Dickinson's work, virtually every poem contains the signatory element. In Robert Frost's work, it's to be hoped that many poems do. For you see, my dear, in reciting the poem, you blundered with one word, wayside. Instead, you recalled the more commonplace roadside. Oh, was this so? I tried to recall confused, roadside, wayside. The poet said, more kindly than chiding. If you can't sense the difference between the two words, you're not sensitive to the higher calculus of poetry. Oh, Mr. Frost, I'm sorry, it was a silly mistake. It was not a silly mistake, but a mistake of the sort most people would make, trying to recall a perfect poem. <laughs> of course, you could not recall, my dear Evangeline, because you could not have written the poem. As you could not emulate the conditions that give rise to the poem originally, Quote, a lump in the throat, a sense of wrong, a homesickness, a love sickness. The poet seemed satisfied now. Mr. Frost was a sort of bully, very familiar to girls and women, who is fond of his victim even as he is contemptuous of her, whose fondness for her may be an expression of his contempt, like his teasing. He lay back in a swing, fingers folded over the Buddha belly. The sun was shifting in the sky now. The afternoon had begun to wane. Overhead, a suffing in the treetops. I resumed the interview with a friendly, familiar sort of question. Mr. Frost, will you tell the readers of Poetry Parnassus what you hope to convey in your poetry? Mr. Frost laughed derisively. If I hoped to convey something, Miss Fife, I would send a telegram. <laughs> Very good, I laughed and wrote this down. In my schoolgirl fashion, I went through a list of questions aimed to draw from the poet quotable quotes, which would be valuable to the readers of poetry, Parnassus, virtually all of them poets themselves. Pleasurably, Mr. Frost leaned back, his hands locked behind his neck, stretched and yawned, and answered my question in his New England draw, which was both self-mocking and sincere. Countless times the great poet had been interviewed. Countless times he's answered these very questions which he'd memorized as he had memorized his carefully thought out replies. 
Unlike other poets who would have become restless and irritable and bored being asked familiar questions, Mr. Frost seemed to bask in the familiarity, indeed like a Buddha who never tires of being worshipped. How different the slack-faced old man was from the dreamy-eyed poet in his early 20s on my bedroom wall. Long ago, he composed his aphoristic replies. Free verse, quote, playing tennis without a net. Poetry, quote, a momentary stay against confusion. Lyric poetry, quote, ice melting on a hot stove. Love, an irresistible desire to be irresistibly desired. <laughs> on invitations to poetry festivals, if I'm not to show, I don't go. Opinion of rival Amy Lowell, a fake. <laughs> Opinion of rival T.S. Eliot, a fake. <laughs> Opinion of rival Ezra Pound, a fake. <laughs> Opinion of rival Archibald McLeish, a fake. Opinion of rival Wallace Stevens, bric-a-brac fake. <laughs> Opinion of rival Carl Sandburg, hayseed fake. Always strumming his guitar, Everything about Sandberg is studied, except his poetry. <laughs> From time to time, the Vatic voice took on a sound of Olympian melancholy, as a god might meditate upon the folly of humankind from above. Everything I've learned about life can be summed up in three words. It goes on. And what is poetry, Mr. Frost? Poetry is what is lost in translation. Mr. Frost paused and continued thoughtfully. A poem is a stream of words that begins in the light and ends in wisdom, but it, as it is poetry and not prose, it is a kind of music, a matter of sound and ear. I hear everything I write. This I took up with a canny little query. Do you mean you hear, literally, Mr. Frost, words in your head? Mr. Frost frowned. Though he liked very much to be listened to, he did not like being queried. I speak aloud to myself. The poem is a matter of measured syllables, iambics, for instance, that produce a work of poetry. Abruptly he ceased. What sense does this make? The young woman interviewer gazing at him so avidly with her wide and heel-all heel -all blue eyes had become subtly disconcerting. A poem is sound over sense? No, a poem is not sound over sense, not my poetry. The babbling of that pretentious prig Tom Elliott might qualify, or infantile lowercase E.E. E. Cummings, <laughs> but not the poetry of Robert Frost. Again, candidly, I ask, do you ever hear voices, Mr. Frost, as you are composing your poems? Mr. Frost frowned, the large jaws clenched, the look of something like fright came into the eyes. No, I did not ever hear voices. The poet is not, as Socrates seemed to believe, in the grip of a demon. The poet is in control of the demon. But there is a demon? No, there is not a demon. This is a way of speaking metaphorically. Poetry is the speech of metaphor. Mr. Frost was frowning at me dangerously, yet I persisted with my innocently naive questions. But, Mr. Frost, what is metaphor? And why is metaphor the speech of poetry? The poet snorted with a sort of derision that would have roused gales of laughter in an admiring audience. Dear Miss Fife, you might as well ask a mockingbird why he sings as he does, appropriating the songs of other birds, as ask a poet why he speaks as he does. If you have to ask my dear girl, it may be that you are incapable of understanding. The scathing rejoinder that would have eviscerated another more subtle interviewer did not deter me for I felt the truth of the poet's observation and did not resent it. But you have never heard voices and you've never claimed to have second sight? I pressed these issues, for I knew that Mr. Frost would not volunteer any truth about himself that might detract from his image of the homespun New England bard. Miss Fife, I've told you no, and you've never had second sight? Scornfully, Mr. Frost asked, what is second sight? The ability to see into the future, Mr. Frost, to feel premonitions, to prophesize. Mr. Frost snorted in derision, in his eyes a small flicker of alarm. Old wives' tales, my dear, maybe in your Scots family, but not in mine. Adding in a smaller voice, 
Why would anyone want to see into the future? That would be a, a curse. In the elderly poet's face, an expression of such pain, such loss, such grief and terror of what cannot be spoken, I looked aside for a moment in embarrassment, thinking, but he is just an old, lonely man. It is mercy he deserves, not justice. And for that moment thinking, maybe I would take pity on him, beginning by destroying the humiliating snapshots in my camera. <clears throat> then Mr. Frost resumed his bemused, chiding, superior masculine voice. Miss Fife, tell your avid readers that poetry is very mystery, quite above the heads of all, no matter what the poet tries to tell you. But readily I countered, yes, but the poet builds upon predecessors. Who have been your major influences, Mr. Frost? Mr. Frost looked at me startled as if a child had reared up to confront him. My influences? Oh, very few. Life has been my influence. But not, but not Thomas Hardy? No. Not Keats, not Shelley, not Wordsworth, not William Collins? No, not to the degree that life has been my influence. The thundery look in Mr. Frost's face warned me not to pursue this line of questioning. For all sensitive, of all sensitive issues, it is influences that most rankle and royal, even the greater geniuses. Like the suggestion that others have helped them crucially in their careers. Yet I couldn't resist asking why Mr. Frost had such a low opinion of Ezra Pound, who had been extremely generous to him when he'd been a struggling unpublished poet when they'd first met in England. Mr. Frost shut his eyes and shook his head vigorously. No comment. I asked, was Ezra Pound mistaken or some sort of fake when he said that a boy's will contained the best poetry written in America in a long time? Mr. Frost's eyes remained shut, but his large, lined face sagged in an expression of regret. Well, even a fake can be correct now and then. Cautiously, he opened one of his eyes, his gaze fixed upon me in mock appeal, as a clock that can't keep time is yet correct twice each 24 hours. Still, I wasn't to be placated. My next question was a sharp little blade to be inserted into the fatty flesh of the poet between the ribs. But, Mr. Frost, weren't you once a friend of Ezra Pound's? Miss Fife, why are you tormenting me with Pound? The man is a traitor to poetry as he was a traitor to his country, a fascist fool, an ingrate. No one can estimate when he became insane. He's insane now, enough of pound. And what is your opinion of Franklin Delano Roosevelt? <laughs> oh, this is a sly question. For Mr. Frost's Yankee conservatism was well known. Even more than Ezra Pound, FDR enraged the poet who stammered in indignation. That cripple! That socialist fraud. FDR's brain was as deformed as his body. Tried to hide the fact that he wasn't a whole man. The idiot voters were taken in. And his wife, homely as the backside of a gorilla. <laughs> Socialism is plain theft, taking from those of us who work and work damn hard and giving what we've earned to idlers and shirkers. My wife, Eleanor, a sensitive, educated woman, nonetheless raved about FBR that, if she could, she would have killed him. <laughs> Which suggests the man's monstrousness, that he would provoke a genteel woman like Eleanor Frost. You may call me selfish, Miss Fife. Yes, I am a selfish artist, for I believe that art must be self-generated and has nothing to do with the collective. Doing good is a lot of hokum. I would not give a red cent to see the world improved, for if it were, here Mr. Frost's voice quavered coyly, for he'd made this remark numerous times, what in hell would we poets write about? My shocked response was expected too, and my wide and blue eyes. Oh, why, Mr. Frost, you can't mean that. Can't I? I certainly do, dear Evangeline. Have you not read my poem, Provide, Provide, in a nutshell, there is Frost's economic theory. Provide for yourself even, it means selling yourself. Bought in friendship is better than none. The chuckle came deep and deadly. Just don't expect me to provide for you. But you are acquainted with poetry, with poverty, Mr. Frost, aren't you? It's quite extreme poverty. No. No, 
Not when you were a child and later when you were married and tried to support a young family on your grandfather's farm and dairy. No, the Frosts were frugal, but we were not ever poor. When your father died in San Francisco, your mother was not destitute. Miss Fife, destitute is an extreme word. I think that you are insulting my family. This line of questioning has come to an end. Mr. Frost's face was flushed with indignation of the hue of an overripe tomato. He'd been striking the swing street beside him with a fly swatter, as if he'd like to be striking me. You don't think we have a moral duty to take care of others? Did Wordsworth feel that way? Wordsworth! What did Wordsworth know? The old windbag didn't have to contend with our infernal IRS tax, Miss Fife. <laughs> he didn't have to contend with the slimy New Deal. Between us, there was an agitation of the air, as if the earth had shaken. Seeing that the poet was about to banish me, having lost patience with even my wanly blonde good girl looks, I plunged boldly head on. Is it true, Mr. Frost, that as a young man not yet married, you were so depressed you tried to commit suicide in the dismal swamp of North Carolina? Mr. Frost cheeks spelled in indignation. Dismal swamp. Who has been telling you such slander? It is not true. Didn't you suspect that Eleanor had been unfaithful to you and so you wanted to punish her and yourself in a romantic gesture? Ridiculous. It's for effete poets like Hart Crane to commit suicide or utter fakes or failures like Chatterton and Rachel Lindsay, not whole-minded poets. A man with a wife and a family to bind him to the earth doesn't go gallivanting off and kill himself. But your poems are filled with images of darkness and destruction, Mr. Frost. The woods that are lovely, dark and deep, except the speaker has promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep. Well, the poem is obviously about a yearning to die, but a resistance to that yearning and a regret over the resistance. Balderdash, Miss Fife, though you are a pretty lass, you are also a hysterical female. <laughs> Reading into poems nasty little messages that aren't there, like looking into a mirror and seeing a snake-headed female who is there and who has your secret face. Vehemently, the poet spoke, not very coherently. The red flush face swelled and throbbed as with an incipient stroke, yet I persisted. Why don't you ever read your dark poems to audiences, Mr. Frost? Why only your perpetual favorites, which audiences have memorized in school? Are you afraid that they will be offended by the darker, more difficult poems and wouldn't applaud you as usual? Wouldn't give you standing ovations that so thrill your heart and wouldn't buy your books in such great numbers? Flush face, Mr. Frost told me that I had no idea what I was saying. I'd better turn off that damn tape recorder or he would smash it. Enough. This ridiculous interview is concluded. I suggest you leave now exactly the way you crept in. Yet boldly I asked Mr. Frost about his patriotic poem of 1942, The Gift Outright, with its remarkable line, The land was ours before we were the lands. Could you explain to the readers of Poor Dear Parnassus what this astonishing statement means? Mr. Frost had taken up the dingy red plastic fly sweater, tapping it restlessly against the swing railing. His voice was heavy with sarcasm. Assuming the readers of Poet de Parnassus could comprehend English, I see no reason to explain a sing single word. <laughs> Mr. Frost, this is indeed a provocative statement. Damn you, Fife, what are you getting at? Frost is not provocative. Frost is consoling. Audiences have loved the gift outright whether they understand it or not. The poem tells us that our ancestors who settled the new world were of the land in a way that later generations can't be because we are American citizens and that the land, our country America, is a gift outright. It is ours. Seeing the expression on my face which was one of utter transparency, the poet said irritably, is it each individual word that perplexes you, Miss Fife, or their collective meaning. Mr. Frost, the collective meaning of your poem seems to endorse manifest destiny, the right of American citizens to claim all of North America virtually. It totally excludes Native Americans, the numerous tribes of Indians who lived in North America before the European settlers arrived, British, Spanish invaders, Caucasians. Mr. Frost cast me a smile of glaring incredulity. Miss Fife. For God's sake, are you seriously suggesting that Indians are Native Americans? <laughs>
Yes, they are human beings, aren't they? Human, but primitive. Beings, but closer to the animal rung of the ladder than to our own. Mr. Frost tapped the Fife rod on his knee with a dangerous squint of his eye. You may put this in your interview, Miss Fife, that Robert Frost believes in civilization, which is to say, the Caucasian civilization. But Mr. Frost, the indigenous, indigenous people you call Indians were the original Native Americans. Caucasians from the British Isles and from Europe came to this continent as settlers, explorers, and tradesmen with no respect for the Native Americans living here. They appropriated the land, exploited and attempted genocide against the natives, and are doing so even now in less obvious ways in many parts of the country. And your poem, The Gift Outright, which might have been addressed this issue with a poet's sharp eye, instead, smirking Mr. Frost interrupted with a sharp slap of the fly sweater. Miss Fife. Genocide is a pretty highfalutin term for what our brave settlers did. Conquered the wilderness, established a decent civilization. But there was not a wilderness here. There were Indian civilizations on, living on the land. Of course, the original inhabitants were not city dwellers. They lived in nature. But surely they had their own civilizations, different from our own. How surprised Mr. Frost was by the passion with which I spoke. You might have thought, as Mr. Frost was possibly thinking by now, that there was something not quite right about this interviewer from Poetry Parnassus with her tape recorder and notebook, who was persisting despite the uh, poet's obvious agitation. Mr. Frost, is it possible that your audiences have been deceived and that you aren't a, quote, homespun New England bard, but something very different? an emissary from dark places, an American poet who sees and defends the very worst in us without apology, in fact, with a kind of pride. And what is wrong with pride, Miss Fife? A fierce light shone in the poet's faded blue eyes. His breath came audibly and harshly. You could sense the old and large heart beating in his chest like a maddened fist and is in the throes of a combative sexual encounter at which the poet, in his inviolable maleness, did not intend to fail. But the interviewer was suffused with ferocity, too, squaring her slender shoulders, leaning forward so that her pale blonde hair fell softly about her face, daring to inquire in the throaty, thrilled voice that hardly seemed the voice of a young virgin or woman. Did you not once say, Mr. Frost, imagining that your remark wouldn't, remark wouldn't be recorded, that you would have liked never to see your children again? Those who were living at the time and causing you so much trouble, they were accursed? I, I did not say that. Who has been spreading such lies? I did not. You've written about this in your sly-coded poems, your inability to feel another's pain, your inability to touch another person. You revealed everything in your poems that has been hidden in your heart which is why in public you deny your very poems as one may deny paternity to a deformed or disfigured child. This is false. This is wrong. I've tried to explain. He drew a deep breath and tried to <clears throat> recite through clenched jaws, quote, to be too subjective with what an artist has managed to make objective is to come upon him presumptuously and render ungraceful what he in the pain of his life had faith he'd made graceful. Primly, Frost uttered these words as if the statement should be sufficient to convince the interviewer, but the statement did not have the desired effect. Mr. Frost, what do those words even mean? That those who see in your poetry something of the terribly flawed and dishonest man who wrote the poems are charged with being ungraceful, while the poet who feeds like a vampire on the lives of others is imagined as being graceful? But that's what poetry is. Not all poetry, not all poets. The subject today is, is you. I, I have no reply to that, miss. The fly swatter had fallen from the poet's fingers to the ground. His fingers appeared frozen, claw-like. Whoever you are and wherever you are from, hell. But do you believe in hell, Mr. Frost? I think that I do. I, I must, I believe, this is hell, nor am I out of it. That grim and beautiful line of Marlowe's, I do believe. This concession rare for the poet, 
fell utterly to placate the interviewer, who perceived her panting query like a huntswoman and showed him no mercy. Mr. Frost, do you remember when your daughter Leslie was six years old, when you were still a young man, a young father, living on that wretched farm in Derry, New Hampshire? You wakened your daughter with a loaded pistol in your hand, and you forced a terrified child to come downstairs in her nightgown and barefoot to the kitchen where the child saw her mother seated at the table, her hair in her face, weeping. Your, feist, your wife had been an attractive woman once, but living with you in that desolate farmhouse, enduring your moods, your rages, your sloth, your fumbling incapacity as a farmer, your sexual bullying and clumsiness, already at the age of 31, she'd become a broken, defeated woman. You told the child, Leslie, that she must choose between her mother and her father, which of you was to live and which to die. Quote, by morning, only one of us will be alive. No, that did not happen. It did not. Yet Leslie remembers it vividly, and we reproach you with it. With a memory through your life, Mr. Frost, is she mistaken? My, my, my daughter is, yes, mistaken. My eldest daughter hates me without knowing me. She has never understood me. And what if your daughter Irma committed to a mental hospital? Why did you give up on Irma when you might have helped her more? Were you exasperated and dis disgusted by her as an extreme form of yourself? Your wild talk, your turbulent moods, your dark places. You gave up on Irma as you'd given up on your sister Jean years, be years before. Mental illness frightened you like a contagion. Mr. Frost protested weakly. I did all that I could for Irma and, uh, and for Jean. I could not have been expected to give up my entire life for them, could I? All that I'd done, they felt no gratitude for, but were encouraged in their wildness and blame of me. Why was poor Irma so obsessed with being kidnapped and raped and forced into prostitution? You were scornful of Ir Irma's terrors. You told her bluntly, when she was just a girl, that she was so unattractive, she needn't fear being raped. No man would be interested in her sexually. She wasn't worth, quote, 20 cents a throw. Later to Robert Lowell, you said laughingly that Irma Frost couldn't have, quote, made a whorehouse. Well, that is not true. That's a slander. Lowell was a sick, distressed person. I spoke to him in a way to lift his spirits, to entertain him. He thought that he was bad, but old Frost was badder. But none of it was meant to be taken literally. And your son, your only surviving son, he'd said, my father is ashamed of me. My father has no more than glanced at my poetry and pushed it aside. He'd said, sometimes I feel tight, strong like a bowl. I feel that I want, that I must be shot straight to the heart of. And your son's voice would trail off and he would hide his face in his hands. The interviewer was speaking in a soft, condemning, condemning voice. The poet stared at her uncomprehending. Small hairs stirred at the nape of his neck. It was very hard for him to draw a breath. Barely he managed to stammer, who, who is he? Who are you speaking of? A sensation of vertigo swept over him. The ground seemed to be opening at his feet. In desperation, he snatched up the poetry notebook in both hands as if to shield himself with it. Mr. Frost, you know that your son burnt his poetry. 15 years of poems. You thought so little of him, you'd never given him permission to live. He was always your son. You never relinquished him, though you never loved him. He was 38 when he died of a gunshot wound to the head. He'd seemed much younger, as if he had never lived. All he wanted approval from you was a father's blessing, but you withheld it. I've told you, I, I, I don't know what, who you're talking about. Your son, Mr. Frost, your son Carol, who killed himself. My son did not kill himself. He died of a regrettable accident. Your son you name with a ridiculous girl's name for some whim of yours. He was so unhappy with Carol, he changed it to Carol to your displeasure. It was too late. The damage had been done. As a young child, he'd been marked. In his poetry, he wrote of how you'd sucked the marrow out of his bones. You left him nothing. You'd taken his manhood from him. He knew your secret. You could never love any of your children. You could love only yourself. Frost shook his massive head from side to side, frowning. I, I loved Carol, 
he knew. You never told him you loved him. He didn't know. Carol was weak, immature. He was not a man. How then could he write genuine poetry? He was a versifier. His best poems were pale imitations of mine. He was a child who has traced drawings in Crayola. His rhymes were stolen from mine. Though, snow, slow, near, seer. Worse were his poems of which he attempt, attempted free verse. Mr. Frost laughed, a ghastly wheezing sound like choking. With the verb of a litigator arguing his case, he spoke with a righteous sort of confidence, though laced with regret. My son thought that, quote, no one loved him. Pitiful. His mind was one cloud of suspicion. His cloud became our cloud. Well, he took his cloud away with him. We never gave him up. He ended it for us, the protected misery and obstinacy of a failed life. A brooding moment, and then. It was an error to marry, initiating a sequence of worse errors, the Frost children. Soon it came to me, though I thought I kept it a secret, that I didn't care in the slightest if I ever saw any of them again at least after my dear daughter Marjorie died. She I did love, I loved very much. Yet what good was my love, I could not save the beautiful girl. She died as a child of anyone might have died, a disappearance. The only sounds, the sweep of lazy wind and downy flake, nothing more in nature than that of grief. A poet ought not to marry and procreate. That was the fear of my wife, Eleanor, that she would drag me down to her mortality and we would make each other miserable, which we did. Poetry is more than enough of procreation. Life is the raw material like dough, but it is only raw, and it is only dough. No one cares to eat mere dough. The poet's large, slack-jawed face contorted into a look of sheer disdain. Astonishingly, he reared up on his legs that barely held his bulk. The notebook fell from his lap onto the grass, like a wounded bull suffused with an unexpected strength by pain and outrage. The poet swayed and glared at his tormentor. He would not succumb. His enemies had assailed him cruelly and shamefully as they had through his beleaguered life, but he would not succumb. You, whoever you purport to be, an interviewer for a third-rate poetry journal, what do you know of me? You may know scattered facts about my life, but you don't know me. You haven't the intelligence to comprehend my poems, any more than a blind child could comprehend anything beyond the braille she reads with her fingertips. Only just the raised words and nothing of the profound and ineffable silence that surrounds the words. Taken by surprise, the young blind interviewer stumbled to her feet also, a deep flush in her face. She gripped the straw bag and backed away with a look of surprise and alarm. Jabbing at this adversary with his forefinger, the enraged poet charged, you are nothing. People like you don't exist. You've never been called the greatest American poet of the 20th century. You've never won a single Pulitzer Prize, let alone several, and you never will. You've never aroused audiences to tears, to applause, to joy. You've never aroused audiences to a feat in homage to your genius. Barely you are qualified to kiss the hem of genius. All you can do, people like you, contemptible little people, spiritual dwarfs, is to scavenge in, in the ruins of the poet's life without grasping the fact that the poet's life is of no consequence to the poet, essentially. You snatched at the dried and outgrown skin of snake, the husk of his skin, the living skin will cast off as he moves with lightning speed out of your grasp. You fail to realize that only poetry counts, the poetry that will prevail long after the poet had passed on, and you and your ilk are gone and forgotten utterly, as if you'd never existed. The poet stumbled down the porch steps, not seeing where he was going. Something glaring was exploded softly, the sun, blazing, blinding light, overhead and agitated, suffering in the trees. He had banished her, the demon. His deep creased face was contorted with rage. The eyes were sharpened like ice picks. In the grass, the poet's legs failed him. He began to fall. He could not break the trajectory of his fall, a fall that brought him heavily to the ground, the stunning hardness of the ground beneath the grass. All his life, he'd been eluding the petty demons that picked at his ankles and his legs the petty demons that whispered curses to him, that he was bad, he was wicked, he was cruel, he was himself. 
All his life they tried to elicit him, to injure himself, as his only surviving son, Carol, had injured himself and succumbed to madness. In the vast reaches of the dismal swamp, he'd first seen the demons clearly and retained the vision through the decades. How in daylight it is a temptation to forget the terrible wisdom of the swamp and of the night, but at great peril. He had blundered this time, but he had escaped. He was not going mad, but madness swept through him. Somehow, he was lying in the grass. Gnats flung themselves against his face. He'd fallen from a great height, like a toppled statue, too heavy to be righted. His fury was choking him, like a towel stuffed down his throat. Somewhere close by, a clock was ticking loudly and mockingly. He would grab hold of the damn clock and throw it, but the taunting girl interviewer had vanished. His notebook, precious notebook, it slipped from his fingers. He strained to reach it, to hold it against his chest. Strangely, it seemed that he was bare-chested so suddenly. The shame of his soft, slack torso, the udder like breast was exposed to all the world. He could not call for help. The shame was too deep. The poet was not ever a weakling to call for help. The obstinacy of his aging flesh had been a source of great frustration to him and shame, but he had not succumbed to it, and he would not. Just Rarely the poet managed to seize hold of a cord of the notebook. The strain of so reaching caused him to tremble, and yet he managed to draw the notebook to him and to press it against his chest. His loud, thumping heart would be protected from harm from the assault of his enemies. For here, here was his shield as in antiquity, antiquity. The warrior has fallen, but is shielded from the pain of mortality. Mr. Frost, oh, Mr. Frost, Already they'd found him, he had scarcely time to rest. He was unconscious at breathing. The great poet had fallen in wild grass in front of the poet's cabin at Breadloaf, Vermont, in a late afternoon in August 1951. Yet the poet was breathing. No mistaking this, the poet was breathing. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. So I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. I've never read this story before. I got so deeply immersed in, in the whole Frost experience when I wrote it. Some years ago, I read a story here that was about, about uh, Ernest Hemingway. It was the same sort of thing. Um, read the great writer's work and just sort of think about it and read some biographies and read their letters and they just seem so so alive and so so vivid but I meant the I meant the portrait of the poet to be a very profound one and that all the little nitpicking things about his life that a gossip columnist might you know right is finally irrelevant so some people, when they read the story, were very angry because I think they only read about half the story and they stopped reading it. But I really meant to show that the poet, the poet transcends the person. And I, I think that is true. I believe that myself. Yes, that's very true. All the quotes, some of you were, sh some of you were shocked at those quotes. Those are real quotes. You were saying, "Oh!" He also said things about about American blacks and Negroes, and I mean, I I didn't I didn't put that in the story. You know, that was a little too harsh. I mean, he was really um, cons conservative, is the word. You know, he was extremely conservative. Yes. Hated to be known to have done a good deed. 
That's interesting. Yeah. But he he did say these things too. You know. I know he had this sa this strange idea of himself that he was bad. You know, I'm he's bad. And it was to mask, I think, a sense that he felt he really was bad. He knows he was bad in, in a kind of comical way. There, there are stories about him at Bread Loaf. You probably have heard some of those stories. Some of you heard the story. Archibald McLeish was giving a reading at Bread Loaf, and, and it was very well attended. And McLeish was a very highly regarded poet. Robert Frost was sitting at the back, and Frost was very upset because he, Archibald Release was doing very well, and the audience liked him. So he had a newspaper then, he, he light, lit a fire he, he <laughs> to get the attention. It was just kind of a playful, a playful mischievousness, you know, which most of us wouldn't do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, any questions about anything at all? Yes. How's it when you first get a book published? Well, it isn't so much the bo books published, just when it's accepted. Because when I was quite young, I was, my first book was published, I wasn't actually that young anymore because it just seemed to take so long to be published, but I was fairly young when it was accepted. I was like 22 or so. So I got the news. In those days, we didn't have email. <laughs> we actually didn't have, uh, we had telephones in those days. But I, but I, <laughs> I got a letter, and I remember that my hands were trembling, and I opened this letter, and it had the most astonishing news that a publisher wanted to publish my book with an advance of $500. $500, my hands had gone completely cold. I remember, and there was a ringing in my ears. I think my, no my tongue had gone cold. It was all this visceral sensation that is exactly how I felt. I don't know whether people feel that way anymore. It's a different world. Uh, when babies have their own little, um, their, self, their cell phones and their, the, the Twitter accounts, you know, it's, it's a different world. But in the old days, we depended on, on what we didn't know it was snail mail. We thought it was rapid mail. It was all we had, it was just mail. So that's how, that's how it was. That was a great question, yes. <laughs> Just right now. <laughs> oh, no, I think a sense of deja vu is wonderful. I mean, there's a whole line of perfume that's a deja vu, you know. That some, of us, some of us are very comfortable with, with that fragrance because we've been around a while, so deja vu is fine. No, uh, I really wanted to indicate by certain hints in the story that Frost has fallen asleep, you know, and basically this is his demon. This is this, this person who's come in the role of the schoolgirl who's sort of sexually desirable to him. And, and then when he stands up and he, he sort of banishes her, then, then she, she kind of disappears. Though Frost liked answering the same questions. He loved being ex exalted in his being, uh, persistent in his being, as I think Spinoza said, that, that we, we persist in our being, and I think that he was quite an extraordinary personality. But the poetry is so amazing. The, the, the poems are really, really wonderful. And I think as with all great poetry, there's no way to paraphrase it. And I may have made up some of the things that he said about the signatory nature of the poem. I'm not sure that he ever said that, but I feel that's true that all great work, including prose fiction and all great poetry, there's something strange and weird in it. It could be what an ordinary person or people in a workshop would say that's a mistake. Because I teach, I teach classic American fiction in my, in my fiction workshops. And we take up stories by let's say Paul Bowles, or it could, be, it could be Faulkner, it could be Henry James, or um, any, any great writer. David Foster Wallace, for instance. There are things in the stories that are weird, that don't seem quite right, that in a workshop somebody would 
would object to. Uh, I know that David Foster Wallace has a surprising um, final line. Sometimes there's an extra line in the story. Um, sometimes there seems too much in, a, in an updike story. Jack London, for instance, has remarkable things that people could not be writing today because he was writing a long time ago. And so he, he does, he puts a lot down. There's a lot of prose and a lot of it to our eyes seems redundant. But when you read it, then there are these wonderful, strange, gem-like nuggets in it that's sort of all mixed in with the other, with the other stuff. So I, th I think that the great writers always have something strange. And Emily Dickinson's poetry is like that because I, I love her poetry very much. I've been reading it for years. But if I try to remember a poem with the dashes too, I will almost always get something wrong because you, to, you would have, have to have been Emily Dickinson to, to do it the way she does it. It's, it's very interesting. It's an experiment you can try with, with a great poet. And Yeats has, Yeats has many of these odd things also. And Whitman, Whitman has many, many strange things. There's a certain um, characteristic that all these poets have, but then they have this strangeness. Yes. Well, we have a, at least one brain expert in the audience, so I have to be careful. We have a neuroscientist here, so when I talk about the brain, I have to be very careful. Um, I have a very, I have something like a photographic memory. It's a very sharp and vivid memory for the work that I've done today or yesterday. That is, if I'm working on a story, I can scroll in my head through the story that I've written. If I'm driving a car, I can copy edit. I mean, I can, I can be working on my story in my head because I remember where things are, and I, I can, I can see mistakes that way. That's, but that fades as soon as I go to the next page, you know, the next thing. But then, if I reread a novel I written years ago, a lot of this stuff comes back to me. You know, I can, I know what's coming next, and I know something's coming here, and so forth. But it's almost like a spatial memory where you have a memory of something that's at the top of a page or a bottom of a page or so. So I don't think it's probably that unusual. And I'm sure may, many poets have completely memorized their poems, and they have variants. The po poet may have a number of variants of, of a poem that are competing in some, in some interesting way. But mem the memory is very necessary if you're a novelist, because you basically have to, you have to keep a lot of things juggling. And then when you rewrite it, you go, the next stage of rewriting is very fast. So that time, it's very easy to remember everything. Like on page 29, somebody does this, and page 229, you might want an echo. You, prose fiction has lots of echoes and parallel things. You start off with the first paragraph, and your last paragraph probably should echo the first paragraph and something in, in between. It's sort of like building a bridge. But you can kind of do that intuitively, but then when you revise it consciously, day after day, you can do it very, very deliberately then. One final question. Yes. The young woman. Yeah, I think I think that poem, "The Gift Outright," is is a kind of uh, outrageous poem, you know. And I think that I think that it's helpful to look at these things without being without being a derisory, but but without be undue reverence, you know. And the the unacknowledged, unexamined racism, sexism, any kind of ism that you see in great, in great works, or not even great works, but just works of literature, I think it's helpful to look at them clearly. And I've always been a great admirer, for instance, of just about every, just about every male writer, <laughs> I have to be careful what I say, <laughs> just about every male writer not living, whom I admire is a male sexual chauvinist pig, you know, I just, <laughs> 
I mean, they all are. I mean, you could just sort of... But, you know, that's just the way they were. You know, you have to sort of love them for the way they are. I mean, even Henry James, the, the things that people would casually say about Jews, casually say about women. When I did research for my novel about Woodrow Wilson and, and Theodore Roosevelt and people like that, the casual things that they would say that people may say today, but very quietly, you know, hoping that you won't be, uh, that somebody won't be tape, taping you or recording you on, on a cell phone or something. But those things were very common, the anti-Semitism. And the misogyny was so natural. I mean, men would make jokes about women who, who didn't even necessarily know they were making jokes. And, and jokes about people of, of, of different races, of, of any, anything that wasn't like a Caucasian, the white male of, a, of upper class. And then very much to do with class. We don't talk much about class today. Uh, we don't talk about caste. But that's, that's even more uh, profound than, than ethnic, than, than, say, skin color, because on the highest level of, of wealth, there is a class, uh, all, you know, kind of global extreme wealth that crosses all the borders of, of uh, ethnic diversity. And that they're just sort of on, on that level. And that's something that I think many people don't don't um, seem to be aware of and don't acknowledge. But all these things are very interesting to write about. And with my students, when my students write about something that is a little bit political, a little bit cultural, just a little bit uh, more than just a private uh, kind of subject, I find that, that there's a sort of electric feeling in the workshop that we've gotten to just a slightly different level. That doesn't mean that the private utterance cannot, is not beautiful and can be very, very profound and very subtle, but there's a something about the slightly higher or the slightly broader sociological or cultural and political uh, that, that pulse that sometimes a, a young writer will, will hit upon, which I, I, even find, I even find sometimes at Princeton, you know, it, it's a, and I certainly find it when I'm teaching graduate students, just a little quickening of excitement that the writer's trying for something more than just a domestic or private or, or erotic experience. Well, thank you very much.